All right, so yeah, welcome uh, to my talk on uh, one VM to rule them all. Uh, I'm Thomas, I'm uh, working for Oracle Labs, which is a research facility of Oracle that we do language and uh, compiler research uh, as well as database research, of course. And um, yeah, so I need this little safe harbor statement here, but I think everybody's seen it. Um, yeah, so why, what do we mean by one VM to rule them all, or why are we doing this? Like, we believe the world is polyglot, and there's actually more and more languages involved nowadays, and not less. And this is like taken from a website called modulecounts.com uh, that shows the various module repositories of uh, Node.js, Java, R, Go, Ruby, and um, all of them are growing. And so there's a lot of multilingual code out there. And if you look at uh, the TOB programming language index, you will also realize that there is more and more languages that are relevant. More and more languages in the top 20 have a very relevant, uh, uh, relevant position. And um, we think we should address this by incorporating a virtual machine that can execute all of these languages and not be restricted to a few. And um, because at the moment, the way it goes is that a lot of different vendors and a lot of different runtimes are reinventing the same structures all over again. Um, so there is like one JavaScript engine and the Ruby interpreter, like both of them need some type of functionalities like garbage collection. Um, Python might need a JIT compiler um, and R has also the need of a JIT compiler. So JIT compiler, garbage collector, and in general, the runtime system is usually duplicated across these languages. But those languages are not that different. So we believe that the core components can be shared between those languages. And our system is demonstrating that aspect. And one of the things we believe will happen moving forward is that a platform that can execute all those languages has the ability to attract more investment and therefore make overall a larger progress compared to the platforms that are only focusing on one specific niche of their own ecosystem. We call our project Graal, um, and uh, this is the overall system architecture of Graal VM. It is built on top of the Java Hotspot VM. In JDK 9, uh, there is a new feature, a less controversial feature, thankfully, uh, called the JVM compiler interface that enables you to um, execute an arbitrary compiler, an arbitrary JIT compiler that is written in Java on top of the JVM. And this is very exciting. We can now, for the first time in Java, plug in a JIT compiler that is written in Java itself into the Java runtime system. And um, yeah, there's less press about that uh, feature in JDK 9, but uh, it's for me, it's more exciting than some of the other stuff. But um, anyway, so one of the one of the compilers you can plug into that is uh, the Graal compiler. And um, Graal is, is a usual Java JIT compiler. It can execute the Java, Scala, Kotlin, Groovy, anything that is JVM bytecode based can be executed with Graal because the input to Graal is JVM bytecodes. And uh, it can, some of this stuff, it can execute faster, I will later demonstrate like, some aspects where Graal is actually better or more advanced than the current uh, JIT compilers. And um, on top of Graal, we built a framework that we call Truffle, which is a framework where you write a language in an interpreter, and um, the, ex the compiled code is automatically derived from that interpreter. So this is um, a theoretical concept in computer science where you take an interpreter, you take an input program that is constant, and from this, you can automatically derive the compiled code. And uh, this interpreter uh, framework is uh, used to execute other dynamic languages on the JVM that have not received as much attention on the JVM. Uh, some of them are supported on the JVM, like uh, JavaScript and Ruby is supported on the JVM. But if you compare the performance uh, with some of the native implementation, then uh, the JVM is still not the ideal target to execute them. And um, we can, with our framework, actually achieve a performance that's absolutely comparable and sometimes even beating 
uh, for example, the V8 JavaScript engine with, with the JavaScript stuff. Uh, so we built JavaScript on top of this, we built Ruby, and uh, we built also R as a statistical language that's of particular interest to us. But um, while integrating these dynamic languages yeah, is kind of challenging and interesting, but we didn't stop there because we also wanted to get some of the static languages into the same ecosystem. And uh, this is where we developed uh, this project so long a way how we can actually execute these native languages as well on top of the JVM. And the way this works is, it sounds a little crazy, but I promise you it works. Like, uh, you, take LLVM bitcode, you take LLVM to compile your static language to bitcode instead of the machine code of the platform. And uh, then you take that bitcode and you write an interpreter for that bitcode that runs on the JVM. And this interpreter is then kind of by Graal optimized. And uh, we have peak performances that is in the same range as LLVM. Depends on the benchmark, maybe 10, 20% slower at the moment, but it's, we can execute these native uh, languages as well on the GVM and integrate them fully into the GVM universe. We actually have two execution modes there. We have one execution mode that's unsafe. That's basically similar to how a native language would usually execute. But you also have an execution mode that is more JVM-like in the sense that it has bounce checks and, and security around it. So that is uh, with, um, with uh, Project Solong. And this is our set of languages that we believe we can handle in the Graal uh, virtual machine. So it's uh, anything that's JVM-based, the dynamic languages like R, JavaScript, Ruby, and also the static languages, all under one compiler, one virtual machine, one execution environment. That's our goal, and uh, I will demonstrate that we are already quite far along that goal. One of the things is for JavaScript, uh, we are not only able to execute JavaScript, we are also able to execute Node.js. So uh, we, uh, we took uh, Node.js standard library, and uh, we replaced the V8 compiler with our JavaScript engine. So we are fully compatible and execute Node as is, and uh, we are just replacing the engine, the JavaScript execution engine, with our our compiler. And that's a similar thing, like for example, Microsoft does with Chakra Core, or um, yeah, or or other engines like uh, Mozilla. I think is also trying to do a similar thing in the Node.js space. One short slide on um, Project Zulong, this LLVM-based thing I was talking about. So we are in this way not only supporting C++, Fortran, we can also support Go, um, because all of this code will, in the end, like be compiled to the same type of LLVM bitcode. Uh, at this stage, all of the languages look the same to us, or similar to us. And we can then interpret that bitcode and execute uh, on the JVM. This execution of these multiple languages, we are using not only to save, you know, resourcing and not have double layers between languages. We also use it for zero overhead interoperability between languages. So in our system, you can take the object of one language and pass it to the other one without any materialization whatsoever. It is kind of, for me personally, it's a very sad type of affair that while we have all these languages around, the main, com the main communication mechanism between the languages at the current point in time is to serialize them to ASCII code in a format like XML or JSON or similar, and deserialize it on the other end again. This seems to be, yeah, this seems to be like a, a very big waste of computing resources, uh, and uh, we believe we can do a lot better in integrating these languages, and there is no need for serialization, not even binary serialization. In fact, we can just take one language of one, uh, one object of one language, and give it to the other one. While allowing all of this, one goal of our project is to uh, have high performance for each individual language. And I mean, performance charts, it's always, you know, it depends on the type of language you're using, uh, the type of uh, benchmark you're using, the set of benchmarks you're using. But uh, this gives a rough estimate of where we believe we approximately are on these various languages. So for Java, we are roughly the same speed as current uh, JIT compilers for Java. However, I will show you some examples where we are better. 
Um, for Scala code, we're actually quite a bit better because Scala has usually more abstractions for us to improve on. Um, this also is shown by a presentation by Twitter, uh, where Twitter is sh showing their improvements with the Graal compiler. For Ruby and R, we had a little bit of an easier time because nobody has so far had the resourcing to invest into a JIT compiler, into a very good JIT compiler for Ruby or a very good JIT compiler for R. So the bar is very low for these languages, and our framework doesn't need this investment in the individual language and can therefore create a, a, a quite a significant speed advantage. Uh, for native code, we're a little bit slower uh, compared to GCC, LLVM, but we believe we can catch up there because there is no fundamental reason why we should be slower. And uh, for JavaScript, we're, this is kind of an old number. I think we are now on par. Actually, we are now better, I believe, at least on the set of Octane benchmarks uh, because the latest uh, update from Google was dropping their scores quite a bit by uh, releasing TurboFan instead of uh, Crankshaft. But yeah, so that was uh, enough on the slides. I, I, I want to, this time now around, we're no longer like a research project that can only show the vision. We're also a research project that can show some, some code and some artifacts. And um, so I will now switch to um, the live demo or the live demos. So um, actually you can also try this at home. Uh, there is like an Oracle Labs GraalVM OTN download um, that contains the binaries under an OTN license, which means evaluation license. Uh, it's available for Linux, Mac, or Solaris Spark as well. And um, after downloading this and unzipping this type of uh, artifact, what you will get is um, actually something that looks a little bit like a JDK. It looks a little bit like a JDK-8 because it's based on JDK-8, but it is actually a JDK-8 with all these enhanced capabilities. And um, so the first thing I'm doing here is I'm exporting a path and I'm basically setting the bin directory. Uh, 0 0.22 is our latest uh, release, but you kind of update once a month. So when you look at this uh, bin directory of GraalVM 0.22, you see some like comments that are very familiar, like Java, Java C, Java Doc, but uh, you actually see other comments that are more interesting in other type of universes. Like there's a Node command, an npm command, there's a Ruby command, there is an IRB, which is a Ruby shell command, and there's also an R command. So all of these languages are together here in one execution environment, and um, yeah, I'm setting the I think I need a colon, if I'm not mistaken. Um, well, we can uh, try that, but just, you know, uh, starting, oh, early. let's just start R. That looks good. Yeah, so now we started R here, which is our modification of R, and uh, we can do some R. Who, whoever programmed in R? Not many here. Computer scientists usually don't do so much. In the future, probably will do more uh, because it is uh, like the fastest growing statistical language. There's Python and R kind of competing, but the real statisticians usually learn R, in particular at ETH Zurich, uh, who claim to have invented some of it. I don't know. But um, so uh, anyway, but R is a fun language. You can do stuff like you know, I'm, I'm doing, you know, I get a vector, everything's a vector. Um, actually, I can ask lengths of one, which is, tells me one, because it's, even that is a vector, like every, every value is a vector. Anyway, that's just a little R here, and that's just to show you that um, the path is set correctly, and we are real here. This is running here uh, on, on Graal VM. But uh, first, I wanted to show you a little bit of uh, Java, fabulous Java stuff. Um, I have here a little micro benchmark, and I'm using here Java Streams API, which is a very large abstraction layer. Um, this is just um, streaming over an array of values, and it's using a reduction, it's doing an integer sum here. And um, I can uh, like um, go into this uh, uh, 
stuff here. I will. I can uh, run this thing. And oops. Probably probably need to compile it first, maybe. Yes. Yes, thanks. So executing that uh, gives us then a number of nanoseconds per operation. That's about 11 nanoseconds per operation that this runs. So um, in TDK9, there's a flag to enable the GVMCI compiler, which is Graal. In our special GDK, Graal is enabled by default. Uh, so we need to disable Graal and to, to use uh, to use the original uh, compiler, basically the server compiler in, in Hotspot. So we do minus xx minus use GVMCI compiler. And we run that. And, uh, well, it's a little slower about 3x uh, speed difference. It's 38 uh, nanoseconds here. When running on stock hotspot, it's 11 nanoseconds running on us. Um, one can play a little bit around here and say like, well, I have a couple of map expressions here, a map x, x plus one, and then a map x, x times two. Let's just make that expression a little bit more complicated because you know it's such a simple example. Um, and I saved that, and I can now compile this again. I'm now running with, with the stock GDK, this more complex stream API expression. And uh, I got a lot slower. Actually, I got now down to 92 nanoseconds for this stream API expression. Um, I can run this with crawl. And uh, at the same speed. Um, so actually, we can see what happens, right? Let's. Uh, so Graal has a little. Oh, I don't have it open now. Okay. Uh, no, that that would be. So Graal has a visualizer actually for those who are really you know experts might want to look at the visualizer. So Graal is effectively able to compile this uh, stream API stuff down to. Um, down to the loop, to the actual loop it should be. Uh, and, um, and because one of the things Crawl does better on than current hotspot is uh, partial escape analysis and inlining. And uh, in this case, the amount of stuff you need to partial escape analyze and inline is, is very big because there's a huge pile of abstraction associated with that stream API expression. Uh, and um, we can compile that away. So as I said on this slide, we're roughly same speed as server compiler, but even for Java, for some interesting complex Java stuff, there is a chance, there's a reasonable chance we have better. Um, but yeah, that's just, you know, that's just, you know, basically making sure that uh, the Java ecosystem is, even in the context of more complex programs, is, is keeping up the speed. So you can write this uh, complex stream API expression without taking the performance hit. And um, the other thing is like, of course, I can uh, run Node.js here as well. So I have here a little Node.js script, just here. I have here server.js. And um, well, it just says hello from Graal.js. It's just a simple express uh, application. It looks like it's almost no code, but you don't won't believe how many code it throws in. But uh, we got the problem with management. Like we, we like, oh, we, we we cannot. We have so much footprint on the code, right? The management says like, well, this is ten lines, right? And we're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's like two hundred thousand lines coming on top, right? But um, so it's um, it's not always visible uh, the complexity behind that. But uh, we can. Uh, can run that server and uh, well oh in use somebody's using that that is 
But yeah, we got a we got the correct JavaScript exception. That's good. Um, okay, so the example app is up and listening on port three thousand. Uh, let's see if that works here. Localhost three thousand and yes, hello world from Grudge. Yes. Okay. Um, that's just you know, but of course I can do now the things like. Um, Actually, JavaScript hasn't a good big integer uh, implementation, so I thought this would be a good example uh, of mixing Java and JavaScript. I can here now say java.mats.big integer. Um, and I can, of course, say similar to what uh, Nason is capable of doing. I can here say um, text, I don't know, big integer value of one dot power of, let's say, 100. And then you want to two string 16. Let me just check with my cheat sheet if this is OK. Yes. Oh, not. But you want two. Otherwise, it's not very useful. So good. Um, yeah, this we don't need because we, of course, want to save every character here. Uh, and um, we can kill this now. I run the server again. We'll see if that works. Yes. So we just called out from our JavaScript Node.js function into Java without any problem whatsoever. And uh, we're running Express here. Like no system is at the moment capable of doing that in reasonable form. Um, and this actually allows you to potentially combine these two worlds where usually you would want to use Java for the more long living business logic uh, type of stuff, right? And then you use JavaScript uh, to, to prototype or, or quickly hack up your microservice, your current microservices exposing that logic. Um, we can not only use big integer here, we can of course also use our own uh, Java class here. So we can here say like hello from Java. And for the sake of time, let's just do the second uh, example also on top here. Uh, because when we are in Java here, we can also call out to another language. And uh, we have a little API that we call the, um, the polyglot API in Java. And uh, I have prepared this little statement here. But I will explain what it does. It is creating a new source object from text in this case. You can also create it from file. And uh, we tell the, the system that this is an R application, uh, that this is R code. Um, this is actually run if is something in, in, in R where you create random numbers. You can do very sophisticated random number statistics in R. And um, we then create a new polyglot engine. We call a polyglot engine like one execution context. This is like one isolate, if you want. Uh, so it's it's one execution context of a, of um, that can run multiple languages, but is inherently like sharing one state. And in that execution context, we can evaluate the source, and we can then cast the result to a Java list, and we can then uh, append that list here to the result. So we now have like a JavaScript application that is, well, we, we still need to do that, right? So here in JavaScript, we need to say text java.type, and we have the class which is called test. It's the test class. And uh, we have a method that's called get string, I believe. So here. Yeah, we have to get string static method. So we're now calling from JavaScript here a Java method. And uh, the Java method is um, creating another context to call out to R. And uh, let's see. Yeah, so we now need to compile with this Truffle API on the class path because we, need, we, we use the Polyglot Engine API. So we're compiling the test method. And we found an unreachable statement. OK. OK, that compiled. And uh, well, let's run it. Let's 
so that server is up and uh, oh class not found exception oh that's a problem <laughs> it's actually funny right it's a javascript exception stack trace but the class not found exceptions so we're exporting the best of java into <laughs> in the, in the javascript it's a <laughs> yeah uh, okay um, we made a small mistake here. We need to put a class path because it's Java, so we need a class path. We need to know where to look up these functions. So we need to set the class path argument to node, which now works here. Uh, and let's start that again. It is listening, and uh, but uh, yeah, here it is. So we now served a request, a JSON a put request, a get request with um, Express, calling out to Java using Java Big Integer, and then using R to create a random list of hundred random numbers and concatenating with as a vector with the string. Uh, so that's uh, three languages in action here. Yes. No, no. It's uh, so our approach to execute languages on the GVM is based on this notion of an interpreter that we partially evaluate. So this is this is a little bit difficult to explain, uh, and we had actually yeah quite some trouble to explain to people how this works because it is like the interpreters are pure Java programs. So this is just an interpreter written in Java. So technically, I can run it fully functional even without the compilation. I just run a Java program that has, you know, execute functions, and it's just calling each other, and that's your interpreter, and that's running R or JavaScript or whatever. Right? And uh, what we then did is just a small trick in the compiler where we create a special compilation from these Java bytecodes where in during this compilation for certain load fields that would usually be a load field to some data or would be a parameter that's coming into the function we replace with a constant because we say well yeah this is the entry entry function to interpreter right and it takes a parameter which is the first statement let's say right but now just assume the first statement is x right and uh, we then install that code into hotspot and it's actually awesome that hotspot allows us to do this so hotspot allows us to we didn't modify anything in the hotspot runtime system so for hotspot it just looks as if there would be like a hundred different compilations for the same method which is the entry method to that interpreter right which are actually a hundred different javascript compilations or r compilations or similar right but the metadata is all structured in a form that for hotspot it just looks like a very stock normal type of method and this helps us a lot because uh, this allows us to do this so-called deoptimization in hotspot to use the deoptimization capabilities in hotspot because from this form we can always go back to the normal interpreter right and then it just executes as a normal interpreter in hotspot right uh, maybe I should put that into the next demo to like because you can actually single step you know in your in your Java IDE through that interpreter as you go and you can use your favorite Java tools to debug that application because it's just the Java application I mean you will trigger the optimization on that method because setting a breakpoint triggers the optimization but but in general you can uh, you can I could step here through as well um, and, and one of the work we've done with, with the Nepins team in particular is to also allow some multilingual stack tracing where you can then have a stack trace from uh, R to Java to JavaScript. But it's not bytecode generation based. We're not creating any new bytecodes at the runtime. And uh, this is a big advantage for us because uh, this means we are not stressing the hotspot metaspace system. Uh, in a way that it's not really designed for um, and uh, because when you start to create bytecodes you will yeah there, there's certain parts of hotspot that are not very uh, yeah that are not designed for creating this amounts of bytecodes 
and uh, we don't need any of that. Right. Um, so, well, the startup is a little bit of an issue still for us as well, right? So, um, this is why we are we have developed a system to allow us to ahead of time compile Java code into a binary. Uh, not to be confused with the EOT function in JDK9. The EOT function in JDK9 is, is to kind of prepare the code for execution hotspot. We have an ahead of time compilation that is allowing us then to fully execute the code natively. It's kind of like a, it's more similar to, uh, there was the, uh, uh, from, from CNU, the Java compiler. Yes. JC, J, thanks, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's that, but it's more conceptually more similar to what, what uh, they did. Um, and I have here a little Java program, which is a factorial tool. It's kind of taking an, uh, you know, a number in, and it, it's it's computing factorial using big integer on the number. Uh, that's my Java program here. Let's kill that web server. Uh, Java EOT. Um, and when I'm like starting this program here, uh, Java factorial tool, and then let's see, 100 or something, right? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm calculating factorial of 100 and, and outputting them, right? And so the, the timing here, the user time, and uh, it's around 100 milliseconds, which is basically the JVM startup, right? And uh, in this little GraalVM directory, which we previously were looking at, uh, 0.22, there is a tool that's called EOT image. Um, and um, when running the tool, we can now, um, let's run EOT minus image. We need to specify, actually we need to specify a name which is going to be, yeah, let's just remove that file because that's from the demo. Um, so we, we, we have we have the name, oops, we do EOT image each name is factorial and uh, we say h column class equals and we say now tutorial tool which is my class let's see if i get the class pass or yes i need to put the class pass to work yeah so this tool is now analyzing that application and determining what is reachable statically from this application and putting only from the GDK the data in that is statically reachable. Um, it's a little bit similar as with Express. This looks like a small example, but it's throwing in a lot of stuff uh, from localization and println and so on, right? But after I did this, I have a, uh, a binary here, which is five megabytes here, which is my pre-compiled Java application. And um, I can run it and I can time it again. And we are here below 10 milliseconds on startup. Yes, so what we're currently working on to enable this type of mode also for our Node.js implementation, because in order to be competitive in startup with V8, we need to have a similar ahead of time compilation for this, for this uh, Node system. But at the moment, what's already working is to pre-compile Java this way and to also pre-compile the language interpreters this way. There are some restrictions, so we cannot do dynamic class loading, which is the main restriction, uh, but they're also restricted at the moment with respect to reflection or you know, weird usage that would prohibit the static analysis. But we are successfully capable of compiling all of the Graal compiler ahead of time, uh, including all of the languages, which is about a million lines of code. So it's it's not a you know, you, not every Java code is at the moment capable of, 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 of being converted this way, but uh, if you want, you can also convert a pretty large code base. So, 
Yeah, so this is basically our answer to the startup issues. And this actually brings Java competitive with Go with respect to startup and footprint for microservices. So um, we believe that the one reason to use Go for microservices is these characteristics. And um, we think that uh, Java developers should have it too. Um, also, we can support Go as well, just, uh, because there is a Go LLVM bridge. But um, so there has been this uh, trend of new projects popping up like Scala native and I think Kotlin native, I think a couple of weeks ago was announced, right? So um, we, are, we are not have made any announcement, but we can execute Kotlin native. Um, and I will show you how that works. I have here downloaded the Kotlin Hello World example here. This is Kotlin Hello World. It's a Hello World from Kotlin. And uh, it's also accessing some Java string. And um, I have here the Java Hello World, which is calling out to Kotlin. So actually, I'm using Kotlin and Java at the same time. Um, yeah, this gets a little hard to follow through because there's a get hello screen from Kotlin and one from Java and, and but um, you get the idea. It's just one program that's that has Java in it, it has Kotlin code in it, and uh, those two things are calling each other. And um, I've compiled this into uh, I've compiled this into uh, a binary here which is called mixed code hello world 1.0 draw with dependencies, which, because this is the dependencies of Kotlin in it. And I can uh, run this on the GVM with crawl. Um, and it says hello from Kotlin, hello from Java. Yes, that's the usual application. But again, if I'm doing here the timing on this, I need again this 110 milliseconds or something like that. Right? And um, now let's see if that works. So I can now, uh, yeah, let's. Uh, I can now run the same thing I previously ran on the Java stuff. Now on the Kotlin things, and I'm using a class pass to the Java file, which contains this bundled application. I'm uh, using a name Hello World, and I'm using the Java class as the entry point. I can choose the Java class as the entry point or the Kotlin class as the entry point. And um, I can run this EOT image. Yeah, it's kind of iterating the classes. It does some type flow analysis, it, more analysis. It got us the universe. Uh, and then it uh, parses inlines and compiles finally. And um, well, now we created this new file, hw, which is here, which is also five megabytes uh, in this case. And I can run it. And this is hello from Kotlin, hello from Java. And if I time it, it's below 10 milliseconds. Okay. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're looking forward to what uh, Kotlin native and Scala native will produce further, but we actually would like to invite those projects to work with us on this type of native solution that's actually polyglot. Because in this type of solution, also Kotlin and, and uh, Scala don't need to actually re-implement the Java class library, because we can automatically throw all of the code in, which is the biggest barrier for some of these projects to succeed, because you need the completeness on the class library. And then again, we would end up in a situation where you're either a Kotlin programmer or a Scala programmer, and they cannot talk to each other, and uh, because you either use Scala native or Kotlin native, and yeah, we think there should be a polyglot native, and this is our solution for that. Yeah, so this is on the on the EOT things. Uh, the requirement for serverless architecture actually forces us into this EOT, um, where we can bring down the startup of Hello World from 100 milliseconds down to five milliseconds. 
Um, we don't need any dynamic compilation interpretation for this code. But with GraalVM, you can still extend it with dynamic compilation because you can still load a dynamic R script, for example, in your pre-compiled application. Um, and one of the things we're um, starting to prototype right now is to also be able to dynamically load Java code into as a Truffle interpreter. Kind of a, it's a Java interpreter interpreting Java. And we can then ahead of time compile that into the system. Which then allows us also to use Java in that context. Um, yeah, so this is on the on the embeddability. So there's a couple of resources on Graal. Uh, there's an OTN product page, including a download, uh, where you can get an evaluation download. Um, what I used here is binaries. It's all available for download there. Uh, we are usually releasing every month a new version now. Um, we are kind of slowly starting to get some feedback from the community, and we are starting to be more confident to invite more people to try it out. Uh, well, still be gently and give us feedback. Um, yeah, be gentle. And um, but uh, we we are confident that we can uh, um, pretty soon uh, have a very good uh, a, a very good um, product out there. Uh, there is also the Graal projects on GitHub. Um, we are currently here on the Graal VM uh, GitHub organization. And uh, Graal, like the compiler itself, is also an open JDK project where we have the compiler and the uh, JVMCI interface um, on, on open JDK. Um, we acquired the handle Graal yesterday. Uh, so not a lot of followers at the moment, but uh, in the future we'll use uh, the Graal handle on Twitter to um, to post updates on this ecosystem. And uh, you can also uh, check out my Twitter account. I'm I'm using it only for updates on that on that Graal ecosystem. Okay, thanks for your attention. I hope I could show you some interesting stuff, and uh, I am ready to answer your question. Thank you. Yes, so we have, we have a little, like, our issue with the JDK9 integration is that we needed to update our patches very regularly due to specification updates. Um, because Graal is actually part of JDK, so we are, cannot opt out of anything. We need to be fully compatible with the current specification of models. Um, and uh, it turns out that actually the JVMCI is a kind of a special case because it's a it's kind of you can plug in an arbitrary compiler model into the GMCI model. But um, so the thing with JDK9 is that we are, GVMCI is part of JDK9, and you can enable this with, um, I think, uh, minus XX unlock experimental feature, minus XX use GVMCI or use GVMCI compiler. Um, so it's 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 a, a few command line flags where you can update it. But at the current point in time, we would uh, recommend not yet to use the JDK9 versions, but to use the JDK8 version that we have on OTN for download. Because we are always not sure. Like usually, it always takes a time when when we have to do a new fix, then it takes some time until it drops into the latest EA. But um, it will be possible to use an unmodified JDK9 binary and plug in Graal as a JAR file. But uh, we are not uh, relying only on a JDK9 strategy. We are committed to provide binaries that are based on JDK8. Um, because we, want, we think we, we want to um, give this to people, frankly, now. And uh, and we don't want uh, to only work starting this JDK9. That is JRuby. 
Yes, so the Ruby comparison is, is probably 10x, 15x. So we are a lot faster than Jiro, yes. Um, so the Truffle Ruby team, is, is Chris Seaton is leading that project. Uh, they have done a very great job. Uh, they have, um, they take a little bit of a different approach compared to JRuby. So JRuby was trying to rewrite most of the native libraries in Java. So they took the approach to reuse code from the Rubinius project and uh, rewrite the native libraries in Ruby. So, uh, which is the naturally, uh, I think it's a better approach overall. But the other important aspect of Truffle Ruby is, and this is what the team is currently very hard working on, is to support native modules, native gems. So they're currently trying to support OpenSSL as one of the core gems. And the way we support it, we support it via Sulong. So Sulong, our LLVM integration, is executing those native parts. And um, this allows us to be flexible enough to support um, those native gems also they are compiled against or, or, or written for the core Ruby runtime. So our biggest advantage to JRuby apart from the performance advantage is that we will support native gems and therefore have a better compatibility story, um, which I think is one of the main items that is holding JRuby back compared to Ruby MRI. Um, so the, this DOT compilation that I showed is only working for JVM bytecode based languages. Right? It's working for Java, Scala, Kotlin, right? And with, you know, working as in, like, if there is reflection involved, there can be problems. And there might be language features in Kotlin, which the, at the moment, not translating correctly, but we could, yeah. So the AOT compilation is only for JVM based languages. It's not for JavaScript. It's not for Ruby R or for the languages that are executed on top of the Truffle framework. And uh, we, uh, it would be very hard for us to extend it to these type of languages in a meaningful way. Because these languages like Ruby and JavaScript, they are so dynamic that EOT compilation is just... <laughs> You know, you, you can you can snapshot, we might be able to do something very snapshot after one run to start with the same configuration again. That can work, but um, but it would be very different to the EOT that we can do for Java because Java effectively is a static language. So the question is on editors, can you keep using standard editors? We have a research project going on with the University in London, King's College London, that are trying to, they have an editor called Echo, that is trying to combine multiple of these languages within one file. Um, I think that's interesting, but it's not a strict requirement, I would say, because, I mean, for demo purposes, you want it in one file, but maybe if you have a larger project, you rather want it in different files anyway. Uh, editor support, one of the aspects that's important is the multilingual debugging aspect. Uh, we are doing here prototypes in uh, NetBeans. Uh, so NetBeans can support this multiple, like multilingual debugging with multiple stacks. Uh, and uh, the other uh, prototype we're doing is with the Chrome uh, dev DevTools, where we integrate with Chrome DevTools to allow to, ex to debug uh, Node.js, but also Ruby and R uh, in the same stack. So it's more on debugging and call stacks. I wouldn't say the editor itself has to support it. Uh, no, I'm just using uh, any editor that can display font in large letters. <laughs> And I think Visual Studio Code is uh, Visual Studio Code is very good for 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 presentations. I wouldn't use it for a larger project potentially, but uh, that's just my personal opinion. 
Okay. Uh, thanks for your attention, and um, yeah, thank you.